All right, Jim. Let's start it up, dude. The game of the week is is a pretty easy one. This we do the game of week awards every week. This was probably the easiest choice, uh, given what's at stake in conference play, the amount of freaking people that were at the game. Lacrosse wins a thriller over Whitewater, 37-34 on that ridiculous game-winning field goal. I don't know if I can get it up while we're both sitting here, but in post, Kobe, insert clip now. Perfect. What a clip. I mean, the the scene was electric. Obviously, neither of us were there, but seeing it from probably eight different angles was fucking incredible. Yeah, that thing was a nuke. I think it was 51 yards. I actually, I saw a tweet this morning. Some kid on the lacrosse football team tweeted, he's like, he's Michael Stack. I think he's like, yeah, Michael Stack is the king of lacrosse. The kid <laughs> That's up awesome. A 51 yarder to beat Whitewater on the road. Like, Dude, in front of... <laughs> Supposedly yeah. twenty thousand one hundred and thirteen fans over there. I did see that attendance. That's absurd. I mean, I mean, I've been to Perkins Stadium a few times. There's obviously like a huge like like seated area, but there's also like tons of like standing room area as well. Yeah, and so, so that I- broke the record for the on-campus Division Three football game. Um, the Overall record still held by the Cortica Jug game between Ithaca and SUNY Cortland. I was at that one in MetLife. That was incredible. But as far as on-campus games go, this one now takes the cake. Yeah, that's 20,000 people. Holy. That's ridiculous, man. It is. Something we were talking about a little bit is uh, Kaiser, Helterbrand, and the way that he's at least kind of transformed in this offense, not very much your typical quarterback per se. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so uh, Kaiser had just 10 for 16, 105 passing yards, two touchdowns. And then he ran the ball 25 times for 100 yards, and then he caught two balls for 39 yards. So he's just kind of like a Swiss Army knife, if you will. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, he's just really good, really, really good football player. So you got to just tip the cat to a kid like that. And then Zach Wire, we, I know I – Keep watching this kid's name. I, last week I did it too, but Zach <laughs> game as well. You know, and anytime you throw two touchdowns against Whitewater, you've probably had a pretty good game. Incredibly efficient too. I mean, nine for twelve takes care of the ball. Obviously, no giveaways uh, from either mm-hmm. of those guys. That's key in a game where the Warhawks. It felt like the moral of the story was self-inflicted wounds, and uh, they're gonna have to do a lot of evaluating in this next week because. They don't get a break. We know talking about their schedule here in the next couple of weeks. But um, that for me was the biggest thing looking back and trying to peep some of the film is like, you know, lacrosse was very opportunistic when the Warhawks faltered for even a play or a series, or maybe just didn't get the, the momentum going. Lacrosse was immediately there to capitalize on that. And that's what ha- you have to do that against really good teams. Now, Tamir Thomas out of the backfield for Whitewater on 14 carries. They held them under hundred yards. That's no small feat. He's been a very consistent model of success out of the backfield for Whitewater. Um, Alec Ogden has been, I think, pretty consistently solid for the Warhawks. I don't see him as a quarterback that's going to go out of his way to win you games, but he certainly is not going to lose them for you either. He still put up some pretty respectable stats. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it just cause it comes down to some really big performances from lacrosse. Jack Studer is another one. Six catches for 150. One of those being an 84-yard touchdown. I mean, those kind of explosive plays are what's going to elevate you above that and lacrosse defensively was super spread out um they didn't have a guy with over seven tackles in the day which is you could say oh maybe not you know anyone standing out that means everyone is flying to the ball everyone's yeah. getting there making plays and that was something for me that that definitely stood out in the kick itself dude we, we watched it. it was that was it was class yeah i mean that's why you play football right there it's that's why, like hell yeah dude that's why you play so i love that but um talk about moving forward at least for lacrosse first, you look at their 4-1 and one right now, their one uh, loss coming at home versus Harden-Simmons, and you look for these next couple of weeks at Platteville this next week, but you still have on the schedule a home game in two weeks from now against Oshkosh, and then you're at River Falls uh, a week before you close out the year. There's still a lot of work to be done uh, for the Eagles over there, right? At uh, River Falls? Lacrosse. 
Oh, the cross. Yeah, the Eagles. Yeah, yeah. no, River Falls Falcons. Um, but yeah, so still a lot of work to be done there. Not to mention, you know, you got a team over there in Eau Claire, and you don't know what Platteville could potentially give them a challenge. So those are not uh, skip over games to them. No shot at Stevens Point at the end of the year, but I expect that one to be a, kind of a cruise for them. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. either way, uh, Whitewater you know, is right back in the mix of things this next week. We'll talk about some of the new rankings that come out after we go over some recaps, man. But currently, River Falls is the number four team in the country. Whitewater is at their place this weekend. I mean, you can look at it one of two ways, right? This could be two weeks in a row where Whitewater gets knocked down a peg, or is this the best time for a bounce-back game ever? Yeah, I mean, anytime you have an opportunity to play the number four team in the country, I mean, those two would essentially probably just swap if Whitewater were to win that game. No, obviously, if Whitewater were to lose, though, that would be two losses. Like, does that does Whitewater get in the playoffs with two losses? Like, and then it's kind of like muddy water. Yeah. Now, you don't, you don't want to drop two. You don't want to drop two games. Especially no, even if they in, are in against conference. the number four or the number 14 teams in the country. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is tough. But um, we won't spend too long on it, but we'll talk a little bit about Oshkosh because of the offensive performance that they had against your uh, Blue Devils down there. 48-46 over Stout in a, gosh, a late-night Pac-12 Maction-esque shootout of a game over there. Um, And just highlighting some of those (laughs) big-time performances, at least individually, Kobe Berghammer, 42 for 52, 466 with five tuds, no turnovers. There were a couple different records he broke because he also had 105 on the ground. You talked about it, man. That dude does it all for the Titans. What did you see from him? Yeah, he uh, he ran for 100 yards as well. So you got to – like that's – he had a record-breaking performance, and they won the game. You know, I just got to tip the cap to him. Um, Yeah, I mean, he made more plays than we did. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to ultimately – but, uh, yeah, 466 yards, you run for 100. I think he had, like, four or five total touchdowns, I want to say. They didn't – Oshkosh also didn't punt. It's kind of an yeah. interesting stat. Oh, um, but uh, for the Blue Devils, though, uh, Patrick, Corker, and Evans, yep. one of my good friends, had a 90-yard kick return, seven receptions from 94 yards. Um, yeah, man, he had a heck of a game. Uh, Cannon Griner had uh, 19 tackles on defense. Damn. And uh, Matt Pometlo, the running back for the Blue Devils, 112 yards, three touchdowns. So he had a career. I mean, you score 46 points. You're going to have some dudes that are balling out. I mean, either side of it, you just come up uh, just a few plays short here or there. Trey Tetzloff, also a single-game record for the Titans. 17 17 catches on the day. Five and a touchdown, yeah. 17 grabs is very impressive. Yeah. Yeah, man, he had a great game. I think uh, uh, Levi Little, I want to say. I mean, that was last name was Little. He had two touchdowns for the Titans as well. So you know, I took the cap to him. Also, you got to give credit where credit is due. His, his bitter is uh, I made London be, Little. But, yeah, London Little. Pardon there you me. Go. Yeah, London Little. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's my job as a D three insider to talk about it every like, all the good games, and this was one of them. So yeah, this one hurts a little bit for sure. I bet. So. I bet did. I mean, that's just an offensive explosion. Explosion, excuse me, from Oshkosh, who was, I believe, without one of their better receivers in uh, Tony's estate. Yeah, yeah, we they didn't have him this week. Yeah, so, but obviously, little little stepped up for him. So. Yeah, and that's you know that's what you need in a team like that. You need to have depth. You need to have guys who can who can step up. But we can stop our WIAC talk at least for a little bit um, and move over some MIAA, which we admittedly have not talked a whole lot about this year. Um, mm-hmm. A couple of really good squads in there. Two of them went head to head this weekend. Hope comes out on top of their matchup versus Albion 14 to six. And, you know, last year it was Albion and Alma, the two that went back and forth. Alma eventually coming up on top until they get knocked out by Aurora, I believe in that second round of the playoffs. Hope this year looking to challenge the reigning champions with a big win over Albion, and now they've got Alma College um, at home. Alma's coming to their place next week, so I'm assuming this will be an MIAA title kind of matchup. Yeah, I mean, this is the, arguably the number one marquee matchup of the year in that conference. You're coming up, so you know, definitely keep your eyes on that one. Certainly. Excuse me. <clears throat> Not a ton of, like, crazy – incredible output in this one obviously a very defensive effort i mean it was 14 to 6 like there wasn't anything yeah it's uh, just black and blue 
yeah. I'm high double football. Yeah. That's what it is, dude. Like that's and that's a great brand of football to play, especially for these guys. They've embraced it. This isn't the first time they've played uh, this style of football. They had a ton of guys defensively who came up with some uh, some really big plays uh, on both sides of the ball here. But um, looking at kind of key contributors, hope in between three different guys here has 50 rushes on the ground and. That is a really good split. Uh, they did only finish with about 148 yards. But again, in this kind of tough game, you're looking to just eat clock and literally just be the last person holding onto the ball. If you look at the actual time of possession here, Hope did just that. And that'd be why they came out on top of it. 37 minutes to 23, Jimmy, in this one. Yeah, I mean, we've said this previously on the podcast as well. When you have the ball for that long, like that's – you're going to win a lot of the time. So Absolutely. I mean, it's one of the best statistics to kind of look at. Uh, another really good one, though, as far as Albion is concerned, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like nine tackles for loss on the day, th- only three of them being sacks. So the Britons getting back in there, getting busy Holy in the God. backfield over there. Yeah. Yeah, getting busy might be an understatement, man. Yeah, Holy dude. God. That's, that's, that's like incredible. A, like 60 hours a week. No, it's not just busy. <laughs> That's, that's ridiculous. They definitely have a uh, a tall task ahead of them in Alma College. You know, their quarterback, Carter St. John, was our D3 Offensive Player of the Week last week, not this week. Um, but looking at that offense with the Scots and what they do very well, uh, the thing is with Hope, they might have to keep up a little bit on that offensive side of things. But potentially the best thing you could do, they could argue, uh, is just to keep the ball out of their hands, right? Keep the ball in their hands, sustain some very long drives, and keep that Scott offense off the field. Looking at some of their stats as far as this year, Alma's currently outscoring opponents 60-16 to up to this point. This offense is incredibly high-powered. Is that per game? They're scoring 60 a game? That's, yes. Wow. Yeah, 59.6 to be exact, but I was wrong. Oh, so not. (laughs) Yeah, right. Bullshit. Uh, But, I mean, they absolutely dominate as far as, uh, especially, uh, you know, in the air and on the ground, both. They're very balanced. They're averaging uh, almost 12 yards per attempt in the air and over seven yards per attempt on the ground. And that is the epitome of balance, dude. Uh, Which is crazy, too, because they're actually on the short end of the time possession stick when it comes to their opponents. They've just been scoring quick and often. Yeah, I mean, I, sure, yeah, I mean, you have to score quick if you're going to score that much. So. Mm-hmm. so that'll definitely be one of our games to look at um, as far as this coming week is concerned. Um, one that we wanted to mention, too, we had talked about it, Lebanon Valley, Widener, 27-24 in double OT. Lebanon Valley comes out on top of this one. That is a pretty wild contest. They improved to 4-1 uh, four and, four and one overall, 4-0 and oh in conference. So that's actually really strong win for them they had two guys at the quarterback position getting it done between tanner lewis and Braden bohannon uh, who had 13 and 16 attempts respectively both threw over 100 yards no picks between the two of them what an interesting kind of setup there huh yeah i mean that's whatever helps you win games i mean ultimately that's all that really matters they had four different defenders register at least part of a sack and then you look at another team that was getting into the backfield uh, early and often, that's five, six, seven, eight, nine, like 10 tackles for loss on the day for Lebanon. That is dominant. You're gonna win. You're going to win a lot of the time if you have 10 tackles for a loss. Because yeah. that means like, you're just backing up the guy, the team on offense, it's going to make it harder for you to first down. Like this. Yeah, and I will those, say, those you, know, you would assume add up. That a team up. like that dominates the line of scrimmage. They only had two rushing first downs in the day. Lebanon was getting it done through the air um, and not really on the ground whatsoever. Hmm. Hey, I mean, like I said earlier, you know, whatever the game plan has for you to win, I mean, that's – you got to roll with that. Yeah, and it's it's interesting, too. You see some of these stats that don't typically coincide with winning. You know, the winning team was 3 of 12 on third down, and there's a couple other stats here. Like, they didn't win the time possession. They didn't do this and that. The so there, are, there are no true tells, right? What was the turnover ratio? Turnover. That's probably the number one – Stat. I mean, besides time of possession, I would say is turnover ratio and time of possession. Yeah, there were no. Uh, ah, there you are. Three interceptions from Widener. That's it. Hmm. Maybe That's I it. know something. Yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> 
three interceptions. That is uh, that is big. No interceptions from the quarterbacks uh, for LVC there. So that was a big one. The last one we kind of want to touch on before we talk rankings. John Carroll versus Marietta. One that I think snuck up on the blue streaks. It was in Ohio at Marietta. I guess they're both in Ohio. But it was uh, in Marietta. Um, and this one was probably way too close for a John Carroll team that – we thought at one point might be potentially giving Mount Union a run for their money in the OAC. Uh, probably not thinking along those lines anymore. But either way, what do you think about it? I mean, if we're talking John Carroll giving Mount Union a run for their money, I think anything can happen any given Saturday. But Fair. yeah, I think if you want to beat teams like Mount Union, you got to take care of teams like Marietta. And that's not to say Marietta isn't a good football program, but you got to. I mean, you only, when you only win by three against a team like that, you're probably not going to have the best game against Mountain Union. But anything can happen any given Saturday. And no, John Carroll, pretty pretty good program. I, you know. They are. And their only loss yeah, of the year, the only blemish on their 4-1 and one record, was a 23-27 loss. That was the opening weekend against Whitewater. Yeah, that's, see, when you only lose to Whitewater by four, it's like, okay, now nah, you can you know you can play with those kinds of teams. Yep. But Dominated have, at Baldwin-Wallace. Yeah, yeah, Dominate but I, just, against I don't want them to. I don't want them to see them like kind of play down to their opponent, if you will. I mean, not that they'd be playing too far down because, like I said, Marion is pretty good. But yeah, you probably. I would expect them to win that game by like maybe seven or ten rather than three. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Otherwise, a lot of the the top ten teams did handle business this week. We can talk about some of the new rankings. Um, at least we talked about River Falls making the jump to number four. So now you have. River Falls at four, followed by, as far as Wyatt goes, Lacrosse at six and Whitewater at seven. And then towards, where was it? Uh, no, I'm thinking different. Is Oshkosh is not top 25, are they? No, 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 they're not. No, there you go. But otherwise, a lot of it really has remained the same. They're, they're good. Oshkosh is good. They they probably should be ranked, if I'm being honest. They're, that offense is really, really good. Oh, I know the one that we were missing, Jim. I wanted to talk about that uh, Ithaca game a little bit. Oh, yeah. Ithaca won an overtime thriller against RPI, which is a pretty big matchup for them just about every year. It's like Raleigh Polytech Institute. I don't know what the hell. Ren Lesser Polytechnic Institute. Holy shit. Um, but that was a that was a huge one for Ithaca on the road. You look at their schedule moving forward, uh, Union College, University of Rochester, Buffalo State, St. Lawrence, and they finish the year out versus Cortland. You run the table as Ithaca right now. You have a great shot. Well, you're guaranteed if you run the table to to win out um, or to get a bid into the playoffs because their only loss comes at Johns Hopkins in week one. That's a non-conference game. So they still have the Liberty League in front of them, and then that game against Cortland uh, in the last week will be a very exciting one. But they had one guy, our D3 Defensive Player of the Week, that was making all kinds of plays in this one, Jim. Let me... Pull it up here. That being Jake Connolly. 11 tackles, four of them solo. He had a TFL. That was a sack and then two picks in this one at crucial times uh, during the game. The only two interceptions for the Bombers. So that was huge. Otherwise, A.J. Wingfield, their preseason All-American quarterback, kept uncharacteristically quiet, 14 for 20 for only 100 yards, a touchdown and a pick. On the ground, he did have a hundred more yards, so that yeah, uh, his yeah, attack I mean, that was pretty balanced. Came, that came a threat, and I've been because I've looked at the stat book a few times. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, running for is. Man, obviously just an incredible game as a runner, at least. Yeah, receiving wise for RPI, they did a great job of spreading the ball out, but um, Ithaca just it looked like kind of lacking that uh, that long explosive play. Their longest play on the day went for 31 yards as an offense. And that's something that I think their offense is definitely built more around those bigger explosive plays. Uh, when they're lacking that, they're going to be in a lot more tight games that they certainly don't want to put themselves in. Yeah, and you want to have like roughly like 7 to 10 explosive plays a game, 10-yard, uh, any 10-plus yard runner and 15-plus yard pass we consider an explosive play by our explosive play standards here yep. at Stout. Yeah, I mean, you want to have at least 7 to 10, I would say, so... And yep. if you only have a handful, you're probably not going to score a ton of points. I hear you. And worth noting, too, Grove City still undefeated, 6-0. and uh, We saw talk about that win over Carnegie, and that's – they're making some making some waves, man. They can make a real push here and be uh, kind of make some noise in the postseason. They're currently sitting at uh, number 23 in the rankings. 
Yeah, I did see that. Yeah, right, right after Mary Harden Baylor, who's two and three. It's kind of funny, like seeing that. Right. Two and six and zero. Oh, yeah. It's crazy, but they they do very much value that you know strength and schedule that that UMHB put themselves through, and I, I can't say I blame them. I don't know if they're still a top twenty five in my book, but I get it. You know what I mean? I understand it. Mm-hmm. I mean, like either way, though, if they went out, they're in. So true. Which is three losses. That's wild. Yeah. I mean, they deserve it. So, like, I mean, the AIC is a pretty darn good conference. So, so you got to go through Harden Simmons. Yeah. That's it. But, yeah, that's all I really got for you tonight. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, thank you, Kobe. Sweet. I'll see you, brother.